How do you summarize a story that was 10 years in the making? Like any other story, you need to start in the beginning. And Temple Ose Shalom began as a concept in 2006. We moved to, to Rose Hill, we moved to Bluffton uh, about 13 years ago, and we realized that there were very few Jews. We only found one of the couple in Rose Hill, and we looked around and we finally decided we would put an ad in the island packet. We put a little tiny three line ad in and we started a group that we called B'nai Bagel. And it was via Havara. We'd meet once a month in each other's house and that went very well. It went very well and successful until we had more people than we could fit in one house. At that point, we called the uh, JEA. And uh, somebody came out from Atlanta, listened to us, listened to what funds we could raise, and he said, you could start a Jewish library, that's about it. And so from there, we said, we can't meet each other's house anymore. And then somebody came from Sun City and pointed out how many Jews there were in Sun City. Uh, Sue and I went to various churches and he saw, looking into, could we start a temple? All four churches were delightful, they were wonderful, they were welcoming to us. They were so helpful, and we decided on the church we're in now to start our temple. Each of the 11 founding members contributed approximately $500 of seed money to the initial budget to open the doors of the sanctuary. Once the decision was made to move forward to secure a place to hold their prayer service, they met with four different local churches that all welcomed them with open arms and the current Low Country Presbyterian Church was selected for its convenience and rental costs and for being near the Sun City Gate. There was an air of excitement and anticipation as the temple was preparing for its first service. That very first Friday evening service on June 16, 2006 will never be forgotten by those in attendance. One of the most exciting things I think about the memory of our beginning the temple was how we all planned and planned and anticipated that if we could get 25 people to come to our first service, we'd be very, very excited. And as it turned out, as you know, we had 167 people show up on our first service, and we were just so excited and overwhelmed at such a great turnout. And then it just continued to build from there, and now, as we know today, we have over 500 members. The Torah is the heart and soul of any synagogue. And thanks to the generosity of Alan Kupfer, Blanche Frank, and Barbara and Al Rubin, our first Torah arrived from Israel printed on red deerskin. It was checked to see if it was kosher by two Hasidim from the Chabad in Myrtle Beach. The Torah's eight Chaim poles were crafted by Brian Baxter. And once the eight Chaim were completed, then came the time-consuming and careful process of rolling the Torah onto the poles. Now the Torah needed to have an iron cottage to embrace it. And like so many like-minded people who have volunteered and given their time, Andy Miklos accepted the call to build the Ark in four months. The Ark is adorned on the side with a tree of life that commemorates the names of loved ones who have left us. A second Torah was donated by Charlotte Fisher in honor of her husband Sam and Walter Diamond made the Eitz Chaim for it. A ceremony was held in November 2006 to dedicate the Torahs, the Ark, and all the other ritual items. Finally, a third Torah was donated by Bill and Roz Altman in 2010 in memory of their parents. So I started working with Sheila and I could do the database for the temple and then she would give me more things to do. And I did the yard sites. And then we did the Book of Remembrance. And each thing, when I didn't know exactly how to do it on Word or Excel, she would say to me, you're smart, you can figure it out. And I did, and it happened. And then one day she said to me, I want to give you more work. She said, so I'll give you a title. <laughs> and that was how it all started. And then she just threw everything my way, and I did it. Our first bat mitzvah was something to get excited about. The young girl, Tiffany Gibbons, read in Hebrew and chanted a portion of the Torah to our congregation in June 2007 
as she celebrated her rite of passage. This was definitely a historical occasion that opened the door for others to follow, and follow they did. The first B'nai Mitzvah class was in May 2008 and consisted of eight women. They studied for months with Bob Wiener, and when they finally walked down the aisle in our temple, they beamed with joy on the accomplishment they had achieved. Not to be outdone, a second bat mitzvah class of nine women studied with Bob for a year and were bat mitzvahed in October 2009. Normally women are bat mitzvahed at age 12 or 13, but these women never had that chance. However, they wanted that experience to fulfill their commitment to Judaism. The youngest in this class was 59, and the oldest was 89. And it was such a pleasure to see an 89-year-old elderly young lady, in mind and spirit, rise to the occasion to attend her own bat mitzvah. I've been Gabbai of the temple since uh, the first or second service. What happened was I walked up to Bob Wiener and I said, do you need help up here running the service? And he said, yeah. And I did everything from bringing him a glass of water to taking the Torahs out and putting them back and following along with the, the reader to make sure we were close to the same place and pronunciation. Uh, and I loved it. Al Rubin brought the uh, Paris Island Outreach Program to the Temple Board approximately seven years ago. And we all thought it was a great idea and pursued putting together a program that we thought would benefit the young men and women that were going through training. And it really does. When we go there, it's a rewarding experience for us. And most importantly, the young men and women that are in training really appreciate us being there. Uh, they enjoy uh, our service, they enjoy having two hours away from drill instructors and, and the kind of harassment that they get there, and it's very important to them. Uh, we hope to be able to continue that program into the future. In December 2008, after some initial meetings with Saul's funeral home, about 50 members of the temple, led by Bob Wiener, consecrated a portion of the Low Country Memorial Gardens as the Oseh Shalom Memory Gardens. The agreement with Saul's encompasses space for 509 burials. As Al Rubin quipped to some reporters that day, historically you can pray anywhere in Judaism, but you need a place for your deceased. Now the temple had that place. Longfellow once said music is the universal language of mankind. And since the beginning of the temple, music has been an element of our services. This began with Al Balkin, an accomplished music educator and our cantorial soloist who played the piano as he sang. He was succeeded by Ken Rosenberg, a former college professor and our current cantor. Our choir, with as many as 17 members, is led by Terry Weintraub, our first Jew by choice and our choir director since 2007. The choir has been such um, an exciting thing for me to get involved with and to get started with, primarily because of the choir members. They have been so dedicated and so fulfilling. They come to every practice when they're in town. And they've come to all of the services when they're around. And although they travel a lot, they're there a lot. But I think that the congregation has really appreciated and enjoyed the music that they've provided, the soulfulness during the year, as well as high holidays. I think it's added an immense dimension to the services that is very fulfilling for all of us involved. Over the past decade, our path forward as a congregation was clearly defined by our board and religious leaders. Our first president was Sheila Goad, and our first religious leader was Bob Wiener. Sheila was followed by Art Krulik, and then Al Rubin. Under Al's presidency, our congregation had a rabbi lead our service, which has continued to this day. Our first rabbi was Bob Siegel. When Al Rubin passed away, he was succeeded by David Weintraub as president, and then Jackie Katz. Once Rabbi Siegel's contract expired, Rabbi Steve Kirshner stepped up to the plate and was eventually succeeded by Rabbi Yosef Levinon. Our current president, Barry Zweiban, 
oversaw the transition of our rabbinical leadership to two rabbis, Rabbi Ken Cantor and Rabbi Ron Simons, each serving our congregation during alternating months. In retrospect, a small group of like-minded Jews were the seeds that created the miracle of our very own synagogue. It has grown over the past 10 years through the volunteer efforts of many people, only a few of which we can acknowledge in this short video. Our affiliate organizations and outreach programs have benefited the membership and the community around us. The Men's Club offers many occasions for our members to enjoy themselves and give back to the community. The Sisterhood convenes various functions throughout the year. The Sisterhood Seder, Card Party, and Fashion Show, to name a few that allow the female members to gather together and have a good time. Many of their programs result in funds that go back to the temple or the community. There are many temple outreach programs, one of which is Backpack Buddies. These volunteers provide nutritious food to the elementary school students who are at risk of going hungry on the weekends. We appreciate and acknowledge all those volunteers we have, may have omitted who have dedicated their time and philanthropy and deserve the credit for their benevolence. So what does the future hold for Temple Ose Shalom? If the past provides any insight, the continuing volunteer efforts of our leadership and supporting members foretells that our future is bright as we proceed to the next decade of providing a place for peace and religious sustenance. <laughs>